This is C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Next, oral argument on releasing the names of Guantanamo Bay detainees. The Second Circuit Court of Appeals will decide if the Department of Defense must release the identities of hundreds of detainees under the Freedom of Information Act. The court heard this case on May 5th in New York City. As counsel for the other uh, cases, uh, after the first one can see, we are um, being covered, or the first argument will be covered on C-SPAN. So uh, in the interest of time, let me just uh, ask, I see counsel are present for the government and for the Associated Press, and you're ready to proceed. Um, after this, we will take a brief uh, recess uh, so that we can take down uh, the extra cameras, and then we'll proceed with the uh, regular calendar. So, Council, you'll have a few minutes, uh, but don't go too far. Um, let me say that we are joined here uh, by video, as you can see, by Judge Winter. Um, Judge Winter is participating by video from New Haven. Good morning, Judge Winter. And uh, he is there uh, having to stay in New Haven because of some personal uh, family medical problems. So as you can tell, he can, uh, you can see him, he can hear us, and he'll be uh, participating. Um, Judge Winter and I would like to Welcome to the bench, uh, Judge Kravitz from the District of Connecticut, sitting by designation. It's a pleasure to have him with us here today. Thank you, Judge Hall. And we are ready to proceed in the United States Department of Defense versus Associated Press. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. May Good morning, Ms. Walstein. My name is Elizabeth Walstein. I'm an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. I represent the Department of Defense. I would like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Your Honors, the records at issue on appeal have all been disclosed in full, except for the names of the detainees in the investigative records and in the Red Cross messages, the names of the detainees' family members. As a result, what the disclosed records reveal is exactly what the detainees' allegations of abuse were or what the resulting charges against the soldier were, what DOD did to investigate those allegations, what the witnesses said about the incidents, what the investigation concluded about what happened, the investigator's recommendation as to discipline or punishment, and the actual punishment imposed on the soldier. And as to the Red Cross messages, uh, the entire content of the family members' letters is revealed, except for the family members' names. The only thing the records don't reveal is which detainee exactly was the victim, and in the case of the detainee versus detainee abuse records, which detainee was the perpetrator of the abuse. And they also don't reveal the names and addresses of the detainee's family members. Ms. Wolstein, let, let me give you a hypothetical. Uh, let's say that a member of your family or a close friend is being held uh, for what may be, for all intents and purposes, incommunicado by the government. Isn't, Im isn't it important that the citizens of this country, in keeping their eyes on the government, be informed of that fact and who that is that is being held incommunicado? I mean, the government isn't asserting some uh, national security privilege in connection with this detention. It's, a, it's, it's asserting only a privacy interest that is essentially the interest of the detainee, correct? That's right. That is always the interest under Exemption 6 in any case, and it doesn't vary based on who the subject of the record is. I must correct the fallacy that the detainees are being held incommunicado. It's absolutely not true. The district court was wrong to say so. They communicate with the International Committee of the Red Cross, as this, the record here reveals amply. Many of them have lawyers who they communicate with through legal mail um, that is not reviewed by the Defense Department. They, uh, the, the lawyers may also visit the detainees, so it's absolutely inaccurate that the detainees are being held incommunicado. Uh, 
and it is important that the public be informed about what goes on at Guantanamo, and that is why DOD released the entire substance of the records. The only thing that is withheld is the name. So the only thing the public cannot know is exactly who was the victim of a certain incident. But in, in the earlier decision, did you, did you not release the names of all the detainees and their nationalities? That's right. We, they, they so, were so actually, everybody in theory now knows who the detainees That's exactly are. right. In a prior case, DOD released uh, the names of every detainee at Guantanamo, along with their nationalities, um, birth date, I think. And then in, a, in the AP1 case, um, DOD also released under the court's order the names of the detainees in connection with their testimony to the combatant status review tribunal. So as there is a large amount of information in the public domain concerning the detainees, both put out by DOD and um, put out by other groups, such as groups that um, represent the detainees' interests um, that have websites. Um, both Ray and Wood indicate that um, uh, one needs to ask what consequences would occur if the names were disclosed. So what consequences do you claim um, would occur? Um, and and, and in, in other words, what's the concern that you're protecting them about? There are a couple of concerns that all fall within the scope of the privacy interest that the Supreme Court has defined, which is the interest, the individual's interest in controlling the dissemination of information about himself. One is an interest in avoiding public scrutiny or public attention, and um, that interest is um, protected in a lot of cases where the information to be revealed is not even necessarily intimate, such as the cases um, involving addresses and names and status as a federal retiree. Um, so that is one level. The second level of, uh, of privacy interest, of, uh, the second type of consequence is, is a, a genuine possibility of harm. Um, in the case of the family members, the um, concern is that there would be embarrassment or retaliation even against What about the with respect members? to the detainees, though? I mean, let's, that's a category separate from the family members. Yes, that is more, that interest there is more in the nature of the unwanted public scrutiny of an intimate, sensitive matter, uh, public attention, public curiosity. But isn't uh, all of that information disclosed in one fashion or another? I mean, doesn't the public know that these persons by name are detainees? They know that they are detainees by name. What they don't know, and the only thing they don't know is... Is the association of the name with the particular report? with the particular incident of abuse. So they don't know which detainee had the pine oil um, thrown at him or which detainee had the incident about the, with the urine bottle. Um, they certainly absolutely know who the detainees are, as I said, as a result of a prior disclosure. Um, so I would say those are the two levels of, of consequences. Um, and certainly the, the district court was... Is I'm sorry. Is, is this, this interest in not having uh, public attention, is that the same interest that uh, was asserted to not disclose the names of those detainees seeking transfer uh, requests or appearing before the board? And I, I note that you've now disclosed those. So um, is something happened to these people now that their names have been uh, disclosed? Well, um, that, that interest was slightly different. The interest there was that was, at that point, the decision concerning transfer had yet to be completed, so there was a delicate diplomatic process that had to follow, and DOD was concerned that disclosure of the identities could disrupt that process. Um, okay, so it wasn't avoiding public attention. That wasn't the interest. It's somewhat different, that's right. Um, uh, the, there is certainly no shortage of case law construing the FOIA privacy exemptions, including the four seminal Supreme Court cases that we've discussed in our brief. And this court also has a number of significant cases um, 
discussing the scope of the privacy interest. Um, the district court was absolutely wrong to completely disregard that case law in favor of this inapposite, completely um, um, inappropriate Fourth Amendment standard, which has really no application in the FOIA context. The Supreme Court has, has given great consideration to the scope of the privacy interests protected under FOIA and has said that that is a question of FOIA law, not constitutional law, and in fact that the FOIA's protections go beyond the Constitution Thank and you. that the idea of privacy is not a cramped notion. Okay. See my red light. You've reserved several minutes for yes, rebuttal? Are. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wollstone. Mr. Schultz. Thank you, and uh, may it please the court. I'm Dave Schultz. I'm here for the Associated Press. And uh, Judge Rakoff, uh, in ordering the names of the detainees who've been victims of abuse, did not misunderstand or misapply FOIA. He didn't adopt a new standard. He accepted settled law and determined that the government's uh, purported privacy interest did not justify the withholding of these names in this case. What's, what is AP's interest? I guess as we are here today, or as you as AP was there before Judge Rakoff, in sure. having these names available publicly. Sure. The AP's interest is the public's interest, and that is knowing what the government is up to. And that is really the dispositive but, test. But how does the disclosure of the names, given that AP given that there has been disclosed the incidents in complete detail, I guess, at least mm -hmm. as reported by the government. Okay. So How does the disclosure of the names uh, facilitate or aid in that interest that you're trying to identify? Yeah, so child, Judge Rakoff identified three different interests, and I think all of them are correct. Um, first, he said that the information is relevant specifically to understand what the government is doing at Guantanamo, um, all apart from the incidents of, of abuse. Um, not knowing who the individuals are makes it impossible to track what's happened to them. It's relevant for the public to know if the detainees who have been abused have never been released, if they've been treated differently. It would be relevant to know if they were all from the same country or all of the same religion. Those types of information... Well, the, 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 the names wouldn't provide the religion. The names would allow you to do that because, as Judge Rakoff said, this has to be looked in the context of all of the litigation AP has pursued here. It has, it has compelled the Department of Defense to release the transcripts of their CSRT tribunals. It has compelled the government to release all the names and identifying information, height and weight to know who's on hunger strikes, where they're from. It's compelled the release of the ARB transcripts. It's compelled release of, of certain transfer and release information. But without knowing who these, this group of detainees is who have been victims of abuse, there's no doubt about that. Um, without knowing that, it's impossible to know how they fit into the system, whether they've been treated disparately, uh, if they're still there or not. So that, that's one. Do, do you have any information that these particular detainees have been treated disparately? It's impossible to tell because we don't know who they are. Well, um, that's, that's let me exactly ask you this. Point. Let me ask you this. Could you uh, ask for the well, name? I'm sorry. If someone has been uh, treated disparately, uh, because of previous complaints, uh, couldn't they file a complaint and wouldn't, and wouldn't that be available to you? I don't know where exactly what you had in mind in terms of where they would file a complaint. Some of these people have lawyers. Many of them are challenging their detention. Um, but, but there's no way for the public to know what's going on. Well, it's not the, yeah, well, that, that, uh, I mean, uh, I, I understand that point, uh, but it's a very general point. My point is, uh, uh, is there an internal procedure at Guantanamo to say that one form of abuse is being treated differently because one, on a previous occasion, filed a complaint about abuse? I, I actually, I don't... For the records of, why can't you ask for the records of those procedures? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, this goes to your point um, uh, uh, that you're unable to find uh, whether people who have complained um, are then abused for that complaint, and I find that a little unpersuasive uh, because um, they can, I, presumably, they can file the same kind of complaint about that, and you can ask for its disclosure. Well, well, Judge, I think whether or not they did, the, 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 the relevant issue here, the standard that's to be applied, is will this disclosure 
shed light on what the government is up to. Judge Rakoff found that it, that it would, and I think that's the dispositive uh, issue here. There was a second ground, or second major area that, that Judge Rakoff said was relevant, and that is it allows uh, the AP to investigate these claims, not knowing who they are, it's impossible to know if we have the whole story. A so, critical so thing could to bear you, in mind. Could, could you do this? Could you ask tomorrow for the names of uh, the names and identifying information of all U.S. prisoners held by the Bureau of Prisons who have uh, uh, been accused of mistreating another prisoner, and, and you would obtain all that information so that you could do your own investigation to see whether that uh, was accurate? I, I would imagine that you could. I think the same standards would apply. Okay, so they and would have no privacy interest, and there would be, you would get all that information as to the Bureau of Prisons prisoners who have been, uh, either the people who have been abused by another prisoner, their information, as well as the, uh, the abuser's information. Uh, uh, two points, Judge. First, we're not arguing that they have no privacy interest. We accept that there is a privacy interest here, although we think that the government really is standing it on its head to say, we're going to protect the rights of the detainees to control information about what happened to them by not letting you know what happened to them. And, and I make that point because the second point I was, I was trying to get to, which Judge Rakoff also found um, persuasive, is that these records that have been released have no information from the detainees. There is no statement of the detainee about what happened. You have conflicting reports often from different government officers that vary widely, you know, whether that someone was thrown to the floor repeatedly and their head hit and they were injured, or whether it was the uh, guard counting push-ups and, and snapping his foot on the ground. Those are serious factual discrepancies. Now, we, we do have those discrepancies, but we don't have the detainee's story. And the do, well, do we entitled know, to track that down. Do you know, based on the information provided to you, how many detainees we are talking about? We, I, I, we're talking about eight specific instances of, of um, mistreatment that were investigated and led to disciplinary charges. Do you charges. know whether those are the same person, four people involved in two incidences each? Incidents don't each? Don't know. And there are, uh, there are uh, three other, I think, believe, three other instances where there are reports but not full investigations. Now, now, you could presumably get that information without knowing the names of the detainees. In other words, if you asked uh, whether these are the same people or not, or if they were given a, a number versus their name, uh, you could even presumably get their nationality. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily indicate who those people were, right? I mean, their names. Potentially, but all that that has been withheld. And and again, I think the well, we understand that, but we've just we're, we're we're still wrestling. I think that the panel is wrestling with the privacy interest versus what interest mm -hmm. is going to be advanced for the public that AP is seeking to advance for the public by the disclosure of the names themselves, as opposed to additional bits of information that might be available, which we will ask Ms. Wolstein about. Sure. But again, I think the legal test here is, is one, we accept that there's a privacy interest. What Favish says is then it was the AP's burden to show that there was a significant public interest in the disclosure of this private information. And what Judge Rakoff said and what the Supreme Court precedent holds is that it is a significant public interest to know what the government is up to. And if we make a showing that this will shed light on what the government is up to, under FOIA, they are required to produce it. It's sort of like a privacy claim. So, if you so why, why didn't they uh, release the names of the Air Force cadets in rows? I mean, you could make the same argument that uh, in order to know what the Air Force was up to, you needed to know the cadets' names. But well, the Supreme Court said the names are not going to tell you what the government's up to. Yeah. Uh, two points on that. One is that that issue wasn't really litigated because what the argument that was being advanced there was whether they could hold, withhold everything because the redactions right. wouldn't be sufficient. The, the, the requester was willing to accept the redacted information, so they didn't really address that information. And if you look at the other instances, like RFs, uh, the Reporters Committee case or the Ray case, the government is very specific that the reason that the privacy interests are allowed to over, override the disclosure is because the disclosure will, dis, will show nothing about what the government is up to. In the reporters' committee, they wanted rap sheets because they wanted to know information. What about the Hopkins decision? Hopkins, Hopkins again, is a case where um, the, the primary interest was, was in getting names of uh, union members, uh, uh, names and addresses by a union. And the government's, the, the, the Second Circuit, Judge Oaks, I think, in that case, specifically said that, um, that 
knowing what the government is up to, being able to investigate whether the wage, prevailing wage law was an interest, a significant an interest, but it wasn't significant enough. And there's, there is a material difference, Judge Winter, between this case and that case. In, in Can you go further and say that if they were to recognize the interest of seeing what government was up to and get the names, that there would be no privacy interest at all? That any government interest then would outweigh uh, the privacy interest. Right, and there's a significant difference. Yeah, there's a significant difference here, Judge Winter, because in Hopkins, what the what the the argument that was being made by the union was, in essence, if we get these these, these names and address information, we can determine if the agency is properly applying the prevailing wage law. So they were really trying to get private information to see if the government was doing its duty. What the AP is trying to get here is private information, which is necessary to understand what the government has done. And if I could just talk for a minute about, or a second, <laughs> my time is about upon this Fourth Amendment point that's raised. The, the Judge uh, Rakoff did not say that the, the Fourth Amendment analysis applies. He just took into account the, the Fourth Amendment construct to looking at the reduced privacy interests. And this is not a case like some of those that the government has cited that said just because you're in jail, you lose an interest in controlling what your bank account is or what your health status is. This is um, an effort to get information about what was done to these de detainees while in jail by the government. But vis-a-vis but -vis you, the AP, as opposed to vis-a-vis -vis the government, that f uh, the, the decreased uh, privacy interest that prisoners have uh, doesn't apply. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis the AP, they presumably have whatever privacy interest uh, uh, people have in their names and information. And so that those cases that were cited, Hudson and Sampson, they're vis-a-vis -vis the government uh, in terms of inspecting cells and, and other things. But vis-a-vis -vis you, those cases ha are irrelevant, aren't they? No, I, I think what, what Judge Rakoff was saying is that the detainees in prison, in, in this detention, involuntarily, without charge, have a reduced expectation that what the government is doing to them will be kept private. And what the AP is really after here is more information about what has been done to them. And it's different than wanting information about their bank account or their employment history or their health status or things, which of course, they, just because they're in jail, that doesn't mean they lose those rights. Uh, so I think that that uh, is really a red herring here. That's not what Judge Rakoff did. Thank you. Right. We'll hear from Ms. Wolstein. Thank you, Your Honors. You know, the constant refrain of knowing what the government is up to, of course that is the legal standard. The question is, how does the names of the detainees in records that have been otherwise disclosed completely in full, how does that advance the public's interest in knowing what the government's doing? DOD has let the public know exactly what happened. Um, during these incidents of abuse because the, uh, by disclosing the entire substance of the records. Um, but take Judge Hall's point. I mean, do we know if this is the same individual in each of these eight cases, for example? Or do we know that it, there are eight different people? Um, if it's the same person being constantly abused, wouldn't that shed light on? on well, what? it's eight different people. Um, and Is that the first time that's been made public? No, I think that's a fair reading of the declaration, uh, the supporting declaration below. Um, but what Favish says is the suspicion that there was some wrongdoing or disparate treatment is not enough. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, AP is alleging here, that maybe there was some difference in treatment by nationality or religion, and that's what a AP wants to uncover. And that's exactly what Favish rejected as insufficient because it's completely speculative. And by what, the what way- What would the government have, excuse me, what me? would AP have to show to meet that burden? Well, they'd have to show that, uh, and there's plenty, plenty of ammunition that they could use to show it. They could show that there's something in the records that we've disclosed that, um, reveals some kind of disparate treatment. They now have all the CSRT records with the names unredacted. They have many habeas filings. If there was something out there in the public domain, and I say there's a lot of information out there, um, I'm sure we would have heard about it and they would have tried to make the showing under Favish. But what we have now is pure speculation that there was some impropriety in the investigation. 
And what the record, the records actually are not as one-sided as AP would have you believe. In, in one case, the case of the um, abuse during an interrogation, it was actually military personnel uh, who raised the allegations and that put in motion the investigation. In another case, the pine oil incident, the investigator refers to a number of detainees having claimed to witness the incident and in fact the conclusion of the investigator was that the soldier did throw pine oil on the detainee's face. So there's nothing more than speculation that there is some wrongdoing here and there's no reason to believe that disclosing the names and allowing the facilitating AP's interviewing of the detainees would reveal um, something, you know, would shed significant additional light on what happened uh, and what the government's doing at Guantanamo. And I do, do also want to correct counsel's statement that once there, once the um, disclosure, if the disclosure sheds light on government operations, the information must be produced. That's not accurate. If the disclosure sheds light, this, the balancing test must be undertaken. It has to shed significant additional light, and at that point, you balance the weight of the privacy interest versus the public interest. And in fact, in Hopkins, the court suggested that perhaps there would be some attenuated um, additional light you know, shed, but nonetheless weighed the privacy interest and concluded that the privacy interest outweighed the, the small you know, additional um, information that could be derived by interviewing the um, subject. Thank you, Ms. Walston. Thank you. We'll reserve decision uh, and we'll stand in a brief recess. Will five, ten minutes be sufficient? If you could all be back here, those of you arguing anyway, uh, in ten minutes, we'll resume. A lower court ruled in favor of the Associated Press and ordered the Department of Defense to release the identities of the detainees. The Second Circuit Court of Appeals has not issued a ruling yet. You're watching C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Next, Supreme Court attorney and SCOTUS blog founder Thomas Goldstein on building an appellate practice. He spoke at the Third Circuit Court of Appeals Judicial Conference in Cambridge, Maryland. Thank you so much 